Amen. Thank the Lord. It's great to be here today. Let's go ahead and take the Word of God and we'll go to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, I was able to come up last night to uh, watch the guys play basketball. Great job, guys. And, uh, and I'll be here today to watch the home game. And uh, trust you're having a great uh, semester. I'll tell you, I think this is the coldest day I've ever had. It is cold here, all right? Now, how many likes the cold weather? Would you like it? I mean, we need revival, I'm telling you, all right? All right? I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, I don't like it, you know? And uh, we have people in our church that like it, and they enjoy it. Do we have any Green Bay Packer fans here? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, all right? We really need revival, all right? So, okay. <laughs> Any Bengals fans here, all right? Yeah, <laughs> all right. All right, I need to change my message, I think, all right? So, but anyway, it's great to be here. Thank the Lord for this college and my kids. And of course, I know Caitlin's here. And we're glad to, that the Lord has this place for them. I remember my days in college and what God did in my heart and life. He changed my life in Bible college. And uh, of course, there I uh, met my wife-to-be. And uh, we got married and, of course, went into the ministry. And uh, we've been in the ministry now uh, almost 24 years. And uh, we thank the Lord for the blessing of being able to serve God. Today I want to bring to you a subject that I think is something that is needed by no doubt all of us as God's people. But I think something you're going to need for the rest of your lives. I believe that the, one of the greatest central themes of the Bible is the theme of forgiveness. No doubt about it. God forgives us and God cleanses us. But could it not be that it's one of the areas in life where the devil tempts us the greatest in the matter of unforgiveness? The 14th president of the United States was, of course, Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce went down in history as the saddest president in American history. Just prior to uh, his inauguration as being the president of the United States, him and his wife, Jane, were on a, uh, of course, a train with their son, Benny. And they were traveling along, and all of a sudden they had a train accident. And Mr. Pierce and his wife were not harmed, but their 11-year-old son, Benny, died in that train wreck. Because of that, right after that, not long after that, they had the inauguration. He was the only president in human history that was not willing to put his hand on a Bible for his inauguration. He refused to do it. He was mad. He was angry at God. He was bitter. In fact, his wife Jane was known as the shadow of the White House because she was so bitter in her heart over losing her son, Benny. In fact, she felt that it was God's judgment upon them for him becoming the president of the United States. You know, in our lives, we deal with unforgiveness. We deal with often times of bitterness that creep into our heart. And maybe right now you could say, well, Pastor Samples, right now I'm right with God and I'm right with other people. Wonderful. But there will come times in your life where you will face with the decision and the temptation to be bitter. Does God have an answer for our bitterness? He does. And this morning I want to preach on this subject, God's answer for your bitterness. We come to Hebrews chapter number 12 and let's begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now let's pick up in verse number 14 of the same chapter. The Bible says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. 
For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Look back in verse number 15. The Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now let's begin today in a word of prayer. Would you join me right now? Father, thank you for the privilege, the great opportunity to stand behind this pulpit this morning and to be able to preach. Lord, I thank for these young people. I thank for their spirit, their attitude. I thank you, Lord, that they want to follow you and they want to serve you. Lord, for the next few moments, I ask you to arrest our hearts and minds. I pray that you would remove any distractions. And I pray that you would speak to us, that you would convict us and convince us of the truth of your word. Father, would you search us now and would you reveal to us the things in our life. And Lord, would, I pray that we can leave this room today with freedom and with joy and with victory in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God's answer for forgiveness or for bitterness. Number one, I want you to notice the characteristics of bitterness. I've been a pastor now just for 11 years. I spent 12 years as a youth pastor. And I think that one thing that I always dealt with with young people was the matter of bitterness. I dealt with it time and time again. I dealt with young people who were bitter at mom and dad. They were bitter at situations and circumstances in life. Bitter because someone hurt them, abused them. They had bitterness in their heart. And I will tell you this. If they dealt with it biblically, they got victory and God used it in their life. But if they lived in that bitterness, it eventually destroyed them. What are some characteristics of bitterness? Now, notice that the Bible says that there is a root of bitterness. Now, if there is a root, uh, by the way, a root doesn't begin as a root. It begins first as a seed. I live in Ohio, and there are many farmers in our church. They're some of the finest people that I know. They're kind of the salt of the earth, per se. And, of course, in the springtime, they're going to be planting. But they're not planting roots. They don't go and buy roots. They buy seed. And can I tell you something? Bitterness always begins as a seed. You know, in fact, sometimes uh, we think of bitterness as an emotion. And there is no doubt that there are definitely feelings that go along with bitterness. It could be anger. It could be a cynical spirit. It could be malice in our heart. It could be revenge. But can I tell you simply what bitterness is? A bitterness causes us to be in a state of resentment and antagonism towards someone that has hurt us. That is what bitterness is. In fact, bitterness is that spirit that is produced in us internally when we meditate over life circumstances and decide that we have not been given a fair deal. In fact, bitterness is simply harbored hurt that is hidden in the heart. You see, bitterness is often that feeling of resentment, that anger that we might have when we have been wounded by people or by the experiences or circumstances of life. In fact, there are some of you maybe that are here today. You have been wounded. You maybe have been wounded by trials and difficulties in life and maybe some circumstances that were out of your control. In fact, if you're not careful, you can become bitter against God. You can almost blame God. You can almost think that God has not been as good to you as He has been to other people. And by the way, the devil puts those thoughts in our minds the devil shows us other people. We don't know every detail in their life, but the devil truly wants us to live in a spirit of bitterness. Now, how does bitterness occur? Going back to the seed principle, I believe that the seed, what is the seed of bitterness? It is always hurt. Now, let me share this with you. I remember sitting in Bible college, and I remember sitting in chapel and seeing the chapel speakers. And, and, you know, I used to think, boy, life must be just so great for them. And it is great serving the Lord. There is nothing like serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't trade what I'm doing for anything else in this world. I love serving the Lord. But you know something? I had no idea the hurt that those men had gone through. I had no idea the hurt that those, those pastors' wives and those missionaries had gone through. Hurt after hurt after hurt. And young people, I want you to know something. A part of life is being hurt. 
you're going to be hurt by people. You're going to be hurt by the challenges of life, by the circumstances of life, by loss in life. It is a part of life. In fact, back in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about in verse number 3 that we should consider Him, consider the Lord Jesus that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Hurt. That You see, the seed of bitterness always begins with hurt and it begins with pain. But what is the soil of bitterness? It is the human heart. You see what happens, we get hurt through life. We get hurt by someone that has hurt us, maybe with their words or maybe with their actions or maybe the betrayal or the rejection or whatever it may be. We are hurt and if we are not careful, that seed can implant itself in our heart. And if we do not do what God wants us to do with it, we almost water it. We take care of it. By the way, do you know what bitterness does often? It replays all the details. We go over and over in our mind what someone has done to us and how someone has hurt us. We replay all the details. We put, push fast forward and rewind all the time. And we're thinking about what someone has done. And what is developing is a root of bitterness. By the way, let's think about this seed. You know something? I could take a seed. Let's take a corn seed. I could bring it here and I could place it right on this pulpit. I'm going to tell you something. I could leave it there for a week and it would still be a seed. I could leave it there for a month, a year, many years. And I'm going to tell you something. That seed would stay just like that. But if you put it in the soil of dirt and you begin to water it, I promise you the root will form and then the fruit of that seed will grow. You see, so often in life, the soil that holds our bitterness is the human heart. And by the way, the hurt that happens to us, we cannot change the hurt. There's nothing we can do about the hurt. The words that were spoken to us, the wrong that was done to us, the hurts in life, the trials, the heartaches. It is not that we cannot do anything about it because it has happened to us, but it is how we respond to it. By the way, I've come to understand that so much of life is our response to life. So much of life is our spirit. I'm thankful to have staff from Fairhaven. And I'm going to tell you something. As a pastor hiring staff, can I tell you the number one thing that I need with staff is their spirit to be right with God. You know, some, they may be gifted, but if they don't have a good spirit, they are not useful in the Lord's work. They may be talented. They may be good in all that they do. But is their spirit right? And by the way... So often, it's a spirit of unforgiveness. It is a spirit of bitterness. So we see, number one, the characteristics of bitterness. Number two, what is the cause of bitterness? You may say this morning, well, how did I develop this bitterness in my heart? Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to see two things. Number one, number one the first cause of bitterness is the unbelief that God is in control. It's an unbelief. Look in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. The Bible says, looking diligently, notice this, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And it goes on to say, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now here's what I want you to understand. The first cause of bitterness is disbelief that God is really in control. You see, someone wronged you, someone lied to you or about you. They stole from you. They were faithful, unfaithful to you. They rejected you. And the moment those things happen, we think in our heart, they should be punished. There should be vengeance brought upon their life. Justice should prevail in this matter. But I want you to know something Folks, today, when people wrong us, God had nothing to do with the wrong. God had nothing to do with the hurt. But He is able in His almighty power to take all of the wrong that has happened to us and to work it together for our good. I don't know how God does it, but he is able to do it. In fact, when Joseph began to grasp the reality that God is at work and always at work in our life, that's when Joseph could say, you meant it unto evil, but God meant it unto good. By the way, have you ever thought about Joseph? How did Joseph not develop a root of bitterness in his heart? Because Joseph believed that God was going to work everything together for his good. 
Joseph said, ye sold me, but God sent me. Joseph was believing in the sovereignty of an almighty God. He was saying, listen, I believe that God is in control of all of the events of life. Now, folks, please understand. The wrong that is done to us is never the will of God. It is not what God desires. But let me say this to you. God is able to work even the wrong and the hurt and the evil that happens to us. He is able to use it in our lives for his good and, our, and for our good. By the way, if today, if you think in your heart, well, Pastor Samuels, you just don't know what's happened to me. No, I don't. You don't know what happened to me. By the way, I know young people that have father wounds. Maybe they had a father that was an angry father, a father that had unrealistic expectations upon their life. Maybe you have mother wounds today. Or maybe a mom that did not care, a mom that was not there for you. Maybe you have wounds from the past and hurt and rejection. Can I tell you this today? That there is a God in heaven who sees all that has happened to us. We must believe that God is in control. We must believe that God is sovereign and that God will use all of that. By the way, I have unsolved mysteries in my life. Do you? I have some things that I don't understand why they happened. But I am believing God. I am faithing God. And folks, when we fail of the grace of God, the ideal is we're failing to trust in God. We're failing to access His grace. This verse is not implying that we can lose our salvation. It is implying that we can come to the place to where we fail of the grace of God. We are not believing God. We are not taking God at His word and a root of bitterness develops. By the way, maybe you say today, well, I'll tell you this, my mom, my dad, my roommate, my coworker, my brother, my sister, they did this, they did that, they ruined my life. Can I tell you what that is? That is an expression of unbelief. It is failing of the grace of God. It is failing to access His grace. Remember what God told the Apostle Paul when Paul had the thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn was. I personally believe it was his eyesight. And if that were to be, he went before God. God was able to heal him of this thorn. But what did God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. Paul, what you need is my grace. I will give you my grace. And let me tell you something. In every hurt and in every wound, God's grace is sufficient to heal the hurt. His grace is sufficient. So we see the first cause of bitterness is an unbelief that God is in control. By the way, young people, I read recently the book of Hebrews where the Bible talks about that we need to take heed lest there be in us an evil heart of unbelief. Can I tell you, unbelief is where we get off track, where we don't take God at His word. We are not faith in God. We are not believing God. So the first cause is an unbelief that God is in control. Secondly, what is another cause of bitterness? It is the refusal to release the offender. Some people may say, I am not going to let you go. You hurt me. You wronged me. You started this, and I'm going to finish it. Can I tell you something, young people? It is not your business to bring vengeance upon another person. Now, let me say this to you. I pray that God can use this in your life today. But you know something? I thank God. I'm grateful to be able to serve the Lord. But I've been hurt through life. I've been wrong through life. I've had some of my best friends to reject me and to, you want to say, stab me in the back per se. I've had things happen to where I look back on them. And I'll tell you, it was a temptation for me just to want to quit. To say, if that's how people are going to treat me, I'm done with this. I am not going to live for God any longer. I am finished with this. And you see, I had to deal with that root of bitterness. I had to deal with it. The cause of our bitterness is that we are in unbelief that God is in control. And then it's a refusal to release the offender. We hold on to the offense. We hold on to it. We water the offense. We, we give, um, we kind of uh, want to foster the offense in our heart. And it's there. We think about it. We are angry about it. And because of that, a root of bitterness develops 
And I'll tell you, it will get us off course. Number three, notice this. What is the cost of bitterness? Now, I'm trying to get to the last point here because I believe it's the most important. What is the cost of bitterness? Number one, it troubles you. Verse number 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Do you know what bitterness does? It troubles you. If it is not dealt with, it troubles you. It hinders your prayer life. It hinders your walk with God. It hinders your ability to read and to study the Word of God. It hinders your service. It troubles everything about you. You're bitter. You're angry. It was not fair. It was not just. And, and uh, they seem to have gotten away with it. But I'm going to tell you something. God saw it all. God knows it all. And He will work it in your life for your good. It troubles you. Someone once said that bitterness blows out the candle of joy and leaves the soul in darkness. Years ago when my wife and I were serving the Lord and I was a youth pastor, we had a young lady in our teen group. Her name was Chavita. Now, what had happened to Javita was wrong. It was sin. In fact, it was illegal what had happened to her. But I'm going to tell you something. Javita lived her life in bitterness. She was angry at God. She was angry at everyone. And she did not deal with her bitterness. That root began to grow and grow, and it produced all kinds of other fruit in her life. It troubled her. She couldn't enjoy the blessings of of being a teenager. She couldn't enjoy all of the great things of life. It troubled her so greatly that it destroyed her life. Young people today, bitterness, it'll cost you, it'll trouble you. Number two, the Bible says also that it will defile. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Let me say this to you. Bitterness dirties your life. It contaminates your life. In fact, bitterness, someone once said, is like a beach ball that if you had it, And if you tried to submerge it underwater, you can keep it underwater for a certain amount of time. But eventually, can I tell you what it'll do? It'll slip and it'll pop up out of the water and it'll splash everyone around you. That's bitterness. Bitterness, you can contain it for a little bit of time. But eventually it comes out for, the Bible says, for the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And you know what happens? Our bitterness comes out. I, obviously as a pastor, I deal with counseling. And you know something, when I counsel a couple, you know what I try to get at? I try to get to the root. Oh, listen, often the root is not the anger. It's not the disagreement. It's deeper than that. And so many times it is the root of bitterness that has been in that couple's heart for many years. It happened years ago and they never dealt with it. They never got it right with the Lord. They never released the offense. They they kept watering the seed of the hurt and the wound in their heart. And they never properly dealt with it. Young people, it will trouble you. It will defile you. But number three, and I want you to notice this, it opens the door to other sin. Now look look at this closely. Look in verse number 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of me sold his birthright. Now I believe that there are two doors that bitterness, if it is not dealt with, will open to. The first door is the door, what the Bible says, fornicator. Now this word, if we were to study it, it means the whole arena of moral failure. It means adultery. It means fornication. It means homosexuality. It means pornography. It means every type of sexual sin. Folks, let me tell you this. It is not shocking when someone in bitterness stumbles. We say stumble, but they choose the path of adultery. It's not shocking when someone who is bitter against God or bitter against other people, they choose the path of of pornography. It is not shocking to me because they are opening that door. The Bible says, lest... We must look diligently in our hearts and lives. If we do not deal with the seed and the root of bitterness, it will open these doors. 
You see, we are trying to medicate the pain. We are trying to do something with the hurt. And I'm going to tell you something. Only Jesus Christ, the great physician, can deal with the hurt in your heart. He's the only one that can heal it. And young people, unless we come to him, and unless we deal with it, it opens the door of the fornicator. But look at, secondly, there's another door. It's the profane person. Now, what is a profane person? I'm thankful that God gave us an illustration because it gave us clarity on what a profane person may be. Esau. God uses Esau. And let me tell you something about Esau's life. Esau, you know the story. He traded his birthright. Something spiritual for something that was temporal. He traded it for just a bowl of soup. Something eternal and something valuable he traded for something that was temporary. Listen to me closely. When a person allows bitterness into their heart and life and they do not deal with that unforgiveness towards someone or towards some situation in their life, if they do not deal with it often, it brings them to the door that's open to them, the door of the fornicator or the door of the profane person. That means, it simply means that they are common. They treat spiritual things as common. You know what Esau did? He looked at his spiritual birthright and he despised it. That's what the Bible says. Now, he didn't hate it as we would hate something that we may don't enjoy eating or something, but he looked down upon it. Folks, let me say this to you. People who treat the spiritual things of God as common, people who treat their prayer life and people who treat coming to church and listening to church and the Word of God as something that is common, it's not valuable, it's not important, they are profane in their life. God has given us an opportunity uh, in our area to have a Bible club in a public school. We literally get to go in during lunchtime and hold a Bible club. It's just been amazing what the Lord has done. We've seen so many young people come to know Christ as their Savior. But can I tell you something? Some of these young people, uh, they've never owned a Bible. Uh, they don't know the things of God. And when they come, they listen to me like you wouldn't believe. You're listening great right now. I'm going to tell you something. These young people, I mean, they're public school kids, and they sit there, and they listen, and they take it in, and they soak it in. I gave them a Bible reading schedule a few weeks ago that my wife put together, and they're reading the Bible. It's amazing to see the desire and the appetite that they have. But what about the Christian who has lost his appetite for the things of God? He's become profane. He has allowed the bitterness he gives to his bitterness. He has to take care of his bitterness. He's got to keep feeding that seed and that root. He keeps going over and over in his heart and mind. He is opening doors to other sin because he will not deal with the root of bitterness. I want you to know something. God knows our bitterness. My dad, uh, my dad is a first generation Christian he grew up in a home where his mom and dad, um, his mom was, did know the Lord, but she was a very nominal Christian, didn't go to church or anything like that, and never taught my dad anything about the Bible or anything. My dad did come to know the Lord as his Savior. In fact, it was a lady that was in the neighborhood who um, hold, held a little Bible study. And my dad went to it. And, and uh, he got cookies and Kool-Aid on that day. And, but he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. I'm going to tell you something about my dad. My dad dealt and has dealt in his life often with his own dad. My grandfather, I call him my papa. He was a cool, cool grandfather. He's with the Lord now. He was the type of grandfather that gave me everything dangerous that my mom and dad didn't want me to have. Now, that's a cool grandfather, all right? You know, my first 22 semi-automatic rifle, my grandfather gave it to me. Never asked my mom and dad. I just came home with it, you know? I said, look what Papa gave me. They're like, what? Where'd you get that? I'm like, Papa gave it to me, all right? You know, my first, uh, you know, motorcycle, a little Honda 50 motorcycle. My grandfather bought it for me. Never asked my mom and dad. Gave me knives, gave me, you know. I remember one time he gave me a little stick of dynamite. I mean, that's a cool grandfather, you know? But I'm going to tell you something about my Papa. My Papa was a bitter man. He was bitter. And he was bitter against God. Can I tell you, when my grandfather was just a young man, they were in the barn. They were shooting rats. That's what they did during those days. They didn't have anything else to do, you know. And so he was in the barn with his brothers. They were shooting rats, just goofing off together. 
Somehow, they don't know how it happened. The mom was out in the, uh, the yard. She was hanging up laundry. Somehow, one of those bullets ricocheted and killed her and immediately in the yard. She was a godly Christian lady. I, of course, I never knew her. From that day forward, my grandfather was so bitter at God. It, he was not until he was 80 years of age that he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. But I'm going to tell you something about my papa. My papa was bitter at everybody. I mean, that bitterness troubled him so greatly. It, I mean, it just riled up in him. He was mad at his brother. He would go years without talking to a brother because he was mad at him. But really, the root of bitterness, I believe, went far back in his life, even as a child, that he was angry at God. You know what? There may be some young people here... You're mad at God because of the way that you look. And you think God has made a mistake in the way you look. Some of you think God's made a mistake in the parents that he chose for you. Some of you think God has made a mistake in the circumstances of life and where you were born and raised. And you look at other people. I wish my life was that way. And I wish I looked like them. And I wish I had their opportunities. And really your bitterness may not be at other people, but it's bitter against God. Can I tell you, bitterness against God is an affront to God's sovereignty. You know what we're saying to God? God, you made a mistake and I don't like it. We are basically saying that God has failed us and God has not been as good to us as he could have been. Now folks, today, if we do not deal with our bitterness, it will consume our lives and it will get us off course and it will destroy every good thing that God desires to do. Lastly and quickly, I want to say this to you. What is the cure for bitterness. Number one, please notice this. Identify your hurt and those who have hurt you. Identify the hurt. That's what the Bible says, looking diligently. Look, if you were to go to the doctor and you were to say, hey, I've got something wrong with me and, and I think this is what it is. You know what the doctor would say? We got to run some tests. I've got to evaluate you. I've got to diagnose your issue. And the doctor's going to run maybe blood work. And he's going to take tests and maybe x-rays. Why? Because he is looking diligently to find the root problem. Folks, come on, tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great physician. And he is the only one who can diagnose the root issue in your life. I was sitting as a youth pastor. In fact, I was a pastor, but my youth director at the time had went to take a church, and I had to take our young people to a camp. And I was sitting at a summer camp. there, just taking care of our young people. And um, during the preaching service, the preacher dealt with a root of bitterness. And I'm going to be honest with you. In that message, the Holy Spirit of God shed his light of the Holy Spirit upon my life and showed me, Aaron, here's an error in your life that you have never really forgiven this person. And I remember, as a pastor, I walked that aisle and I got on my face and I said, God, I forgive this person for what they have done. And Lord, I ask you to take it from me. And Lord, I, I know that you're able to work all things together for my good. And I'm going to tell you something. God used that in my life and he's given me victory because of something that I had to identify that needed to be dealt with. First, we must identify the hurt and those who have hurt you. Listen, we ought to ask God to bring to our mind the root of bitterness. Bring to our mind the errors in our life that we're off track. Maybe you have not forgiven a parent. You have not forgiven a, a childhood friend. You have not forgiven someone who has hurt you. But maybe for some of you, you're mad at God. The God who is perfect, the God who is just, the God who is sovereign, the God who makes no mistake. In fact, your bitterness is a dissatisfaction with God's choice in your life. It is saying, God, you have made a mistake. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. That bitterness will destroy your life. We must identify the hurt and those who have hurt us. Number two, we must forgive and release it to God. I was reading a book one day about Andrew Murray and how that Andrew Murray was talking about how that we must surrender ourselves to the Lord. And so often, for many of us, we have a wrong idea of surrender. So for many of us, it's areas in our life that we will not surrender to God. And you know what? In that moment, the Lord dealt with me about issues that maybe you say, Pastor, I can't release this to God. I can't give it to God. I can't. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 
We are to say, God, I give you this offense. I release it to you. And in, in fact, it is a matter of faith that we are believing that God has not made a mistake. We are believing that God is going to use that in our life for our good. But one day, I just couldn't give it to God. But in that moment, the Spirit of God dealt with me. And I said, God, I can't give it to you. But if you will come and take it, then Lord, I want you to take it. And can I tell you something? In that moment, God gave me victory. He gave me help and hope because I could not give it to him. But I said, Lord, I can't do it. But if you'll come and take it, the Lord take it from me. I release it to you. You see, we must identify the hurt, but we must forgive and release it to God. And young people, can I tell you something? Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice that we make. And by the way, it is a matter of obedience to God. By the way, you know what forgiveness really is? It is to go to God and say, God, I forgive so and so. I forgive them for what they have done. And I'm believing that you will work this together for my good. Number three, not only do we forgive and release it to God and identify the hurt, but number three, and this is the last thing, receive God's grace for your hurt. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to see this. The Bible says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now let me say this to you in closing. Grace heals hurts. God's grace heals hurt. Now, what is grace? Well, grace is a gift. Now, I, I don't know if back at your home, if you still have your Christmas tree up. If you do, God help you. All right, that's fine. Okay. Uh, whatever you have, you know. But what if I were to walk into your home and I were to see your Christmas tree up? I say, man, you need to take down the tree. All right, first. But what if you had the Christmas tree up and you still had presents under the tree? I'd say, man, are you crazy? You know, don't you know what could be under there? I mean, open the gift. But what if you said, no, I'm just kind of waiting. I'd be like, why? Look here. God has an unlimited supply of grace for every hurt, for every wound, for every pain, for every disappointment for every trial, for every area of your life that doesn't seem fair and that does, does not seem just, God has a gift and you must unwrap the gift of God's grace. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? How do I access God's grace? Because grace heals hurts. And if we fail of the grace of God, we fail to access the hurt. It, it, it is kind of like this. i I grew up uh, just uh, very allergic to bee stings. Now, I don't get close to death, but you know something? I, 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 I swell up and all of that. I worked for a pastor for 12 years that if he got stung by a little sweat bee, he had to be rushed to the hospital. I mean, he had to, in course, he eventually got the EpiPen, and so he was okay. But I'm going to tell you something. What if he got stung by a bee and he doesn't want to go to the doctor? I'd be like, hey, man, go to the doctor. The doctor can help you. The doctor has what you have need. No, I'm, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to die. I'm just going to suffer through this. And some of God's people, they suffer through life. And they do not go to the great physician that will heal the hurt in their life. How do I access God's grace? I'll tell you how you access it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter number 4. Would you turn there in closing? Hebrews chapter number 4. I want you to see something. Hebrews chapter number 4, and let's go to verse number 16. The Bible says, notice this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of, what's the next word? Grace. That we may obtain mercy and find, what's the next word? Grace to help in time of need. Folks, how do you open the gift of God's grace? You open it the same way you open the first gift of God's grace, by faith. 
You see, when I was 17 years of age, I didn't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. But God spoke to my heart and convicted me of my need of the Savior. I knew I was a sinner. And can I tell you, I got on my knees before God. And I said, God, I don't deserve to be saved. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, but I'm asking you now to save me. Can I tell you what I did that day? I accessed God's gift of salvation. It's for by grace are you saved through faith. But can I tell you something? There's been many times I've been hurt and wounded and disappointment in life. And I've had to go to the throne of grace that I can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace to heal my heart. Grace to give me hope and to give me faith. Grace to encourage and strengthen me to keep going on. And when I come to God, I say, God, I don't understand why this happened. God, you know what so-and-so did to me. But God, I forgive them. And God, I'm believing that you are working this together for my good. And let me tell you something. By faith, I'm taking God at his word. And can I tell you what God does? God gives me the antiseptic of his grace. Years ago, I heard this story, and I want to give this to you in closing. A man by the name of Bruce Goodrich. Bruce Goodrich was being initiated into the cadet corps at Texas A&M University. One night, Bruce, just as a young man, was forced to run until he dropped. But the problem was with Bruce that he never got back up. Bruce Goodrich died before he ever entered into college at Texas A&M. A short time after the tragedy, Bruce's father, who was a known believer in Christ and a faithful, dedicated Christian, wrote this letter to the administration, the faculty, and the student body and the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M, and he said this, I would like to take this opportunity to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of concern and sympathy from Texas A&M University and the college community over the loss of our son, Bruce. We were deeply touched by the tribute paid to him and the battalion. We were particularly pleased to note that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. He went on to write, I hope it will be some comfort to know that we harbor no ill will in this matter. We know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an, op had an appointment with his Lord and is now secure in his celestial home. When the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one answer will be so that many will consider where they will spend eternity. I want to say this, how did Mr. Goodrich have that attitude? I don't know, except for God's grace. How could he not blame the university and blame God? And how could he not let bitterness destroy him and consume him in life? Because he believed in a God who makes no mistakes. Young people, I don't know your life, and I don't know what has happened to you, but I'm going to tell you this, some of you have been hurt, you have been wounded, and that root of bitterness is there. But I'm going to tell you something. You can come to the Lord today and He will give you His grace. Now you'll have to keep accessing His grace. But I'm going to tell you something. He has grace that is unlimited for your life. But maybe some of you, you think, I'm doing good now. But I'm going to promise you, you will be hurt. You will be wounded. You will be times of disappointment and distress in life. You can access the grace of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love and your mercy. And Lord, I thank you for these young people. They've listened so well today. God, would you help us? Would you minister to us right now? Would you do your work that only can be done? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. How many?